Hi everyone, my name is Sharzad, and I am so excited to be bringing you this new conversation series where I interview teens, parents, and educators across America to discuss the harmful and potentially harmful effects of social media. I am doing this in collaboration with an incredible organization called the Organization of Social Media Safety. Their main mission is to keep teenagers safe online and also to educate parents. So please join me in having a conversation with the two founders, Mark and Ed. Hi, Mark and Ed. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to talk to you guys about your organization, Organization of Social Media Safety. I would love if you could both introduce yourself and then I'd love to talk about the organization. So Ed, if it's okay, let's start with you because you're the founder, right? I'm the co-founder, yes, between Mark and myself. I'm the co-founder, National Education Director. Uh, the, the organization started actually due to an incident that happened to my son about five years back when he was injured uh, during a, a violent attack where he suffered a traumatic brain injury and everything was recorded. Basically, he got punched in the back of the head. Everybody recorded this. They posted it on social media. They were sharing the videos, making memes of the video, you know, doing everything that we hopefully teach our kids not to do. And it went very viral very quickly. Uh, which is really how I met Mark because it got to Mark's office where he was working at the time, I think in the same day, to be honest with you, within hours of this happening to Jordan, Mark was made aware of it. And uh, you know, fast forward five years, we're here today. And I'll sort of let Mark tell you what we did with this organization and how we formed it. But that was that pivotal moment that started it all. And is your son okay? The answer to that is my son is different. Hit a traumatic brain injury. He spent six days at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, wonderful hospital. They did what they could, but a brain injury lasts forever. And his personality sort of changed. He was this outgoing, energetic drama student, you know, always vying for the lead role or wanting to be up on the stage and grab the mic and try out for football. I remember all these things. And he has not been the same since that moment. It's 180 degree change to his personality, which, you know, we adjust to. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. So Mark, you saw this horrible video and then you, what, how, yeah. To let me know your, your side of the story. Of course. So I was a chief of staff in the California state assembly at the time. And we covered the San Fernando Valley, which is where Ed and his family lives. And, this video came across my email, I want to say in, in about two hours, which is how quickly this stuff goes viral, this video and, and others like it. And it, it obviously was horrifying. The office saw it, our office saw it at the time. Uh, everyone was horrified. But we all had a really intuitive sense that this, this type of attack, these types of actions were happening on a far wider scale across the country, if not globally. And so we dug into it because we wanted to see if there was anything we could do legislatively. We found out that what we now call social media motivated violence or attacks committed for the purpose of filming them and putting them on social media to get internet notoriety, the likes, the shares and the views. So those were really doubling since the birth of major social media around 2006. And you can track that. We tracked it through press reports, which isn't exact science, but you really can see how it it ramped up from about four of these attacks in 2006 uh, from what was then called the knockout game. So kids would walk up behind an unsuspecting victim and try to hit them in the back of the head as hard as they could film it and put it on uh, Facebook then at the time or Facebook live. And then you fast forward to 2016 where we were uh, when Jordan was attacked and there were hundreds and thousands of these videos across the internet. And there were websites just dedicated to hosting them as well. And so we knew something had to be done. We drafted a bill uh, that came to be known as Jordan's Law, which uh, we passed in less than a year, which was great. It's the first law in the country to deter social media motivated violence. But while we were doing that, we realized usually as a take a step back here, usually as a legislative staffer, you have an organization to rely on to be your subject matter expert because you handling tons of issues at a time and you need to go to the experts for, for the ones that you're working on. 
there was no consumer protection organization focused on social media then, and there was no one working on social media motivated violence. And it was shocking to both uh, Ed and me. And this was despite the fact that at the time, so we're now in 2017, uh, social media related cyberbullying was fairly clear at that point. Uh, human trafficking, I had worked extensively with Foster throughout my career. Human trafficking and the connection to social media was also fairly clear at that point. Uh, misinformation and propaganda, we were coming out of the 2016 presidential election. So that was becoming clear too in how foreign countries were trying to impact democracies over the world. Hate speech, particularly during the 2016 election, over and through social media was also becoming clear and and no one standing up and protecting us from these dangers uh, with an expertise on social media and how they're being propagated through social media. So we felt like there was no choice and we we started the organization for social media safety. Wow. And what is the main goal? Because I know you guys cover a lot of different things under that organization, not just creating a law, but quite a few other things. Will you let me know like the main mission and goal of it? So the mission is to make social media safe for everyone. So we protect against all social media related dangers. Those are dangers that are either caused or made worse by social media. So a lot of the dangers I just listed, uh, or all the dangers I just listed are part of that cyberbullying, hate speech, trafficking, eating disorders and mental health impacts. There's, there's unfortunately a very long list. Uh, so our job is to protect against all those dangers. We do that using a comprehensive consumer protection oriented model, which is just a fancy way of saying that we have three departments that we work through. So we do education work. We are in K through 12 schools across the country, teaching students, parents, and educators, essential social media safety skills. We obviously do work like we're doing here as well to make the public aware of these dangers, which is vitally important. Can't understate the importance of that. We do advocacy works. We work on public policy to enhance social media safety at all levels of government. And then we do technology development work. So working on software and apps that provide real-time protection against any of those dangers. A lot, right? <laughs> it is a lot. I, I, it is a lot. And I think um, I, uh, I have a, like a unique position in this because I've been a content creator for like 11 years and I know how mean the internet can be. I've experienced so much cyberbullying over the last 11 years. I even was harassed once so badly by this person who kept creating new accounts and I knew they knew where I lived and that made me feel really nervous. And I remember going to the police because I, I just didn't know how to stop it. They didn't threaten to hurt me but I was actually scared of them. And uh, cause it was somebody I knew in person and there was no law. The co I remember the cop being like, yeah, there's just really nothing we can do if, if they want to kill you, you know, and they say that then we'll help you. But until then we can't do anything. And the, the guy was really apologetic and he said, I'm so sorry, but the, the law just hasn't caught up with social media. And it, you know, and this is, I, I was an adult at this point, you know, so I, I, I and then I, I ultimately, you know, they, they stopped harassing me and, and haven't since knock on wood, but it's, it was awful. And I always think about how much worse it would have been if I was a teenager being harassed and how horrible that would have been. And then I, I think about my own kids growing up with social media and I, I get this knot in my stomach because I think, how are they going to navigate this? So I'm personally grateful for the work that you guys are doing. I'm also overwhelmed by how to protect my kids. I'd love to know what parents can do. I know you have a course, but I also love to hear, I have, I have so many things to say, so I'm probably going to go in circles about this, but I'd love to know if, for parents listening, how they can start to keep their kids safe. That is a huge question, if not one of the fundamental questions. And parents are having such a hard time, not just in the U S we've, we've been across the world. Parents are having a hard time across the world. So uh, the first thing is, uh, we're seeing a lot of guilt from parents. I, I let my child onto this platform. I don't know what to do. There's, there's a lot of guilt, too much screen time. Everyone's in the same boat. So 
no need, yeah. no need to, to feel guilty, but there are steps that you can take to maximize safety for your child on social media. If you decide to allow them on, which is, which is probably a separate question that we could get into. So if you go onto our website, you could find our free comprehensive parent course. And I'll summarize that really quickly. What we found when we were starting this work several years ago, um, is that because parents were confused and didn't know what to, to do in terms of protecting their children, rightfully so, we didn't grow up with this stuff. We didn't grow up with social media. So you turn to the internet and you get a tip here, a tip there. You, you go to the, the yeah. parent, parent room and mill, right? And uh, get potentially some tips, or you even go to a talk and get some one-off tips. And it doesn't necessarily work because it's really hard to implement one-off tips. So what we found was you really need a comprehensive system and you have to think about it like a system. When you take a flight, your pilot has a checklist of things they need to do before you take off that was organized by experts based on research and experience ahead of time. So that's how preventative safety works. It's it's comprehensive and you follow a system. So we created such a system that we call the buckling the social media seatbelt system. Uh, and it has three categories that we want every parent to think about before their children get on to social media, or of course, if your child is already on social media. Uh, first is the conversations, the social media safety conversations to have with your child. In raising awareness of the various dangers, we find again and again that children are not aware of these dangers that they can encounter on social media when. or are likely to encounter, yeah. right, or when they encounter them. They cannot avoid or most safely respond to a danger if they don't understand it or know what it is. So those conversations are hugely important. Second is the rules uh, that you need to or th should think about implementing in your family when it comes to social media use. Rules that we want our children to follow every time they log on or every time they come across a certain situation. And then the third one is the settings what settings and how to calibrate the settings on your child's devices and apps. So it's all three of those categories working together. Now to make it comprehensive, we have a full checklist of conversations that parents should think about having with their children. And a checklist makes it simple. You've got it in your hand and you just go down one by one. We have a full template of rules available um, on our site as well and a tutorial of how to calibrate those settings. Yeah, I loved your course. I'm making my way through it and it's so thorough. And one thing that I found interesting is that you guys break up all these different ways that you kids can be unsafe, like you were saying. Some of them I didn't even think about. I didn't even realize that just like witnessing cyberbullying could be as damaging as being the one getting bullied. So could you guys, kind of give me like a brief overview of the ways that kids can be unsafe on social media. We could take three hours right. doing that, right? Yeah. So, um, so I can highlight a few, but you, you brought up cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is, is a, a big one. And you brought up uh, witnessing cyberbullying. So we found and other studies have found about 90% of fifth or 12th graders are going to see cyberbullying on a regular basis. So basically that means if your child's on social media, they will see cyberbullying. And with a lot of these dangers, our concern is normalization. So watching it over and over again, what does that do not only to uh, their mental well-being, but also their likelihood to both perpetrate cyberbullying themselves? And we would theorize that it significantly increases that likelihood. And what does it mean to children that are being cyberbullied to see it everywhere? Uh, uh, there we would theorize it makes children more passive. So they're going to receive and absorb that harm over and over without doing anything to protect themselves. So we find across the country with parents and educators, this is a far more common and severe danger than people even realize. And we all know the word cyberbullying. We all know that it's happening. We just don't understand the specifics of that. So uh, it's a huge example. It's having huge ramifications across the country for our youth. Just being desensitized, you yeah. mean? Like just being like, oh, yeah, there's another person, you know, getting cussed out on the street or whatever. Ha ha ha. Like just not even caring, like less empathy. 
Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. And then seeing that everyone else is driven to get likes and shares and views, yeah. whatever the platform, whatever the platform we're finding, it's fairly common through, through the social media platforms, which is also why, as an aside, why we don't think parents necessarily need to become an expert in the features of Snapchat or any given platform. These principles are really running the, the spectrum of, of social media. And so just understanding them is going to help keep your children safe as opposed to be taking the time to become an expert on a given platform. I know on the website, there's a lot of, um, I think you guys share some really concerning statistics about, um, or I've seen statistics, maybe they're on your website also, about like the rise of social media and the rise of teenage uh, suicide attempts, um, anxiety, depression. Can you share some concerning stats so that we can, uh, and then we can talk about them? Yeah, so whenever we share those stats, let me start off by saying that the existing universe of research uh, shows correlations. So social media use goes up and we see in a lot of studies, suicide, depression, other mental health issues go up. No study at this point has proven causation, but obviously the, these existing studies are concerning enough where we're moving forward at this point as if there's causation. But we want to be careful about clarifying that because we operate from uh a need to be evidence-based in everything that we do. We want parents and educators and the schools we work with to trust the information we're putting out. So we're very careful to clarify where we're getting information from or what that information is. And our programming is always evidence-based. So uh, that being said, you know, some of the studies we cite so often, there's one study that shows that social media use among teens uh, over five hours a day will increase suicidal thoughts by over 70 percent. Oh, my so God. Huge correlation there. Wow. Uh, there's another study uh, that suggests using social media every day is increasing uh, depression as well. Uh, and most teens, again, are, are using social media every day. And we've found that on average, they're using it four to five hours a day. So yeah. uh, these are really concerning studies. Uh, I should say that that we do have a new partnership with UCLA to improve, right? Very exciting. To My school. You would write. <laughs> Go Bruins. Yeah. Uh, to improve a lot of this research, because there's a lot we don't know. We get asked uh, every time uh, Ed's at a school, he gets asked, how, how, how many hours a day should my, I allow my child to be on social media? I was going to ask that. We don't have the research for that. So yeah. we, we don't give an answer on that. You know, we cite these correlations and suggest that limiting the amount of time is a safer yeah. bet. But there's no study out there that says X number of hours is is potentially a threshold for safety. We don't we don't know that at that point. So that's something that we will be working on. We get that a lot. A lot of parents looking for that answer. I I, I know. I feel like um, screen usage in general. My my kids are young, still five and eight. But as Ed and I were talking about earlier, it, um, before we started recording, time flies, and so I want to be prepared. A lot of my friends have kids in the same age group as me, and we're always thinking about, you know, how much screen time is okay. And um, I personally have had to create healthy habits around social media so that I could feel happy and not anxious and depressed. And I found, and I, I love that you had this tip on there because I thought it was so good Ed. two of the main habits that I have are putting my phone uh, out of my bedroom. So I don't look at my phone morning and night and I don't, uh, we're not allowed. Nobody's allowed to have their phone when we eat. Eating is so fun and important for me and my family and my culture. And the thought of it being ruined by a screen and scrolling um, really upsets me. And I really feel like it's important to model the behavior that I want my kids to have. So can you speak to the importance of like parents modeling the behavior that they want their kids to have. I mean, is that one of the most, if not the most important thing? I want Ed to answer this, but I want to, okay. I want to have you or add a, just a statement to what you said earlier about having eight year olds. So remember that eight year olds across the country are on social media. We see eight year olds on TikTok. Like they have their own accounts. They, oh, yeah. They're on TikTok, yeah. they be, but they're on TikTok, they're on YouTube, they're on Roblox, Fortnite. And so there's a long list of social media applications that eight-year-olds are already on and yeah. 
suffering harm from. So, so people should be aware of that. Yeah, Just going back funny. to the modeling as you have younger kids, Mark has younger kids. My kids are all 18 and up, 18 to 22. And again, I did not grow up with social media. Same. And they grew up with it in their hand. You know, when I got divorced, my, all my kids had a phone. There was no course. We had nothing. I just gave them a phone because everybody else did. And I realized modeling was, someone told me a long time ago, your kids are like sponges. We've all heard this. They absorb everything. And if you don't believe that, just have a random conversation, throw in, you know, some random thoughts about uh, words about taxes and this and that, and your kids will start repeating that to you. They're listening and they're watching everything you do. So I, that tip about leaving your phone away from your bedside table and putting it in the bathroom or charging it somewhere else. My kids see me do that. Now they're again, they're much older than your kids, but they actually do that because they don't want to go to bed with that in their hands. So modeling is everything. They will yeah. watch everything you do, especially at this age right now with these young kids. So if you model that behavior, I love the fact that you don't allow a phone at mealtime because mealtime yeah. is so important to communicate. And, and you could have those conversations at dinner time about yeah. social media safety and you can bring it up there and have a discussion. Why don't we have our phones at the table right. when some of your friends, parents, you know, the kids do? And yeah, for for better or worse, I'm really honest with my kids. So I, they know about this whole conversation series that I'm doing with you guys. And I've talked to them that there can be really bad things on the internet. And I've told them that I've been bullied before. I don't want them to think that they can't ever talk to me about something. And I really also liked Ed that you said that in the course that even if there has been a mistake, or even if your kid is the bully, you want them to still be able to talk to you so that you can kind of work through that. Um, so how important is just open communication? I mean, can you speak to that? Well, I can speak to it as a parent. Yeah. Communication is everything with your children. But when it comes to social media, having that open conversation to the dangers, as Mark said earlier, to the dangers that there, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when they're going to stumble upon these dangers. They are there. I have been to schools where kids have come up to me after the presentation and said, I saw your son's video. Oh, I watched shit. it. Yeah. And they, you know, we didn't, and I remember I, I get chills because this one girl, I'll never forget this, said, you know, I didn't realize that that was your son. You know, I didn't realize like he was somebody's right. son until of you course. spoke at my school. Yeah. And now I'm realizing. So having this communication with your child every day, the right. phone is in their hand. If they have a phone, it's probably in their hand every day. This is probably a silly question, but do you think that there's like a good age for them to get their own apps i mean or do you That's just a in, a, in a perfect world is it just like never <laughs> <laughs> it's such a difficult question and this is what we teach across the country that that parents face and we don't talk about this at all and we need to do a better job of getting small beds out there <laughs> but um but parents face this lose-lose situation and you're probably already facing it with your eight-year-old so what happens Every parent of this age group, I think, can relate to this across the world. One or two kids gets TikTok or Snapchat in fourth or fifth grade. So by the platform's own admission, too young. But this is what happens. So one or two kids gets those, those apps on their phone. Pretty soon, the entire class has it. Why? Because social media is social. social. And yeah. this is how these kids are developing their friendships, strengthening their friendships and, and just conversing through these platforms. So if you decide that your child is not ready for a certain app or it's not safe, uh, then there's a real trade-off that you're facing. That's real that we need to be honest about that, that your kid's not going to be able to partake in some of these social interactions and it's detrimental on that side. So parents mm -hmm. have to weigh the very real dangers of these apps with the, the very real social detriment. And it's an impossible it's choice. Good. Yeah. One of the interventions that we do with schools is create what we call community guidelines around social media use and social media safety. So developing age of entry guidelines where we get the whole community on board with them to prevent this kind of creeping process of children getting onto apps too soon. Uh, now to go back to your question of, of when it's safe, it, it first of all, it depends on the app in a way. Some apps are safer than others. Snapchat is used by younger children, but we're really pushing that it's an older teen app. 
there's a lot of dangers buried into to or baked into Snapchat, and we're seeing a lot of unfortunately, tragically dead children uh, directly from Snapchat use. Mm. So it, it depends a little on the app. All of these social media apps, for the most part. Uh, have a, have their own rules that that you need to be 13 and older to use the app. We're not seeing that followed really at all across the country. So, you know, at the very least, we'd like to see 13, um, but we would like to see older teens on, on a number of apps. How responsible do you think the apps are? And do you ever think that there's a way that they could limit the amount that they allow like each user to be on the app? Do you think like getting rid of likes or comments or things like that would be helpful or what? Yeah. What, what responsibility do they have and how can they be better? They have a tremendous responsibility is their, their product, their service Mm -hmm. that they are putting out there and children are being harmed by. They're all aware that the product is dangerous and they continue to put it out there for younger teens. They continue to market it market their products to younger teens. So, you know, the suicides from cyberbullying, deaths from drug abuse, from drugs purchased over these platforms, uh, predation, human trafficking, the platforms know this is happening. And and we say, uh, oh, the the mental health impacts too. Look at Instagram's own research that their product causes negative body image issues in their teen users, particularly girls. They know this stuff. Uh, so they have the ultimate responsibility here in terms of protecting the children. And, you know, the real answer is probably not allowing the younger teens on the platforms, but they're, they're not going to do that. So our job is, is to hold them accountable. Aside from potentially blocking younger users, which some of them should be doing, we think, there are safety features that they could be using right now that we know would protect millions of children. Third-party safety apps like like Bark that we recommend and some others. Mm -hmm. Some platforms use them, others don't, like Snapchat and TikTok. And so we are legislating that at the federal and state level to require them to give parents a choice to you to use those options, which we know from the data will protect children. Uh, but they they continue to refuse to do it voluntarily, unfortunately. The creators of the apps and stuff. Wow. How can parents listening like get involved with your organization if they want to? There's a full range of ways to support it. We need that support. This is, as you can tell from the conversation, a huge mission. So people come in and bring their expertise and volunteer just like you're doing. And we're so grateful for that, that, you know, can't understate the importance and the impact of that around the country from people stepping up and and offering their services uh, to help educate people on these risks. That's huge. Uh, Or, or help us with some other programming that we're doing. Uh, Signing up for our course, just signing up for our newsletter list to keep yourself updated so you can share that information with your community, bringing ed to your school so that we can teach uh, your children and teach you and teach your educators how to stay safe. That's, that's a huge one. Parents do that for us across the country, uh, which we're so grateful for. How, how do we get Ed to the school? <laughs> <laughs> how do we get you Ed? I mean, I know I'm in LA County, but how do, how, how would anybody go about getting you? Go to our website, socialmediasafety.org. Uh, I'm sure it's, it'll be in the notes or something. Of course, yep. And you can find our phone number and our email address and just give us a call. You can also find our information there on our school-based services. And you could share that with your principal Mm -hmm. as well. And, uh, you know, once we have those introductions and principals are aware of our services, they almost always bring us in because there's such a need there. And what do you, what are some of the top things that the parents are asking when you meet them? You said a couple of them right there. How old should my child be before they go on social media? Mm -hmm. How many hours a day should I allow my child to be on social media? Those are the first two questions I get asked. And again, like Martha, there's really not an answer to that. Uh, Really after the presentation, it's Mm eye-opening. I will tell you this, parents will come up to me and their eyes are opened wide. And they said, I had no idea. And I said, neither did I. Right. This happened in Jordan, which is why we've started this whole organization. Mm -hmm. But really, they come to get educated on what's going on in the world of social media. Because, again, none of us were raised with it. Our kids, you know, the phone 
is in their hand all the time. They're born. This is their right. way they communicate. And there is, I, I always like to say this, there is a good side to social media. It's not all 100% yeah. bad. Yeah. There's philanthropic things we can do with social media. And so, you know, I try to, when I speak to kids, I always tell them in the beginning, I'm not the social media social media police. I'm not here to take your phones, but I'm here to really educate you on what's going on in the world of social media to keep you safe. I would add that to that too. This is new. It's frustrating. It's a challenge for parents, but we started this nonprofit and we do this work with the idea that it is surmountable, that we can significantly mitigate or eliminate a lot of these risks by taking these right steps, you know, the building and structuring the habits is is a big part of that but but this is uh in some ways a winnable war for for parents out there they need a lot of help both from the law from the schools and the community uh but it is winnable it does take a village that's it's good to end on a optimistic note <laughs> there is hope yay there is hope. There there is hope. Hope. thank you so much thank you all for tuning in and watching. Thank you, Sharzella, for doing this. We are so appreciative. Yes. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Thank you guys so much for listening to the conversation. Um, if you want to check out the organization, I will leave a link to wherever you are getting this video or audio. Um, again, it's the Organization of Social Media Safety. I highly recommend making your way through their super course. It's essentially a masterclass in social media safety and how you as a parent can keep your child safe on social media. I took the course, even though my oldest is an eight-year-old, because I obviously am really interested in this conversation and I want to be super prepared. Um, and it's free. I don't know if I mentioned that, but it's totally free. So check it out. And if you're interested in booking Ed to come and speak at your school, um, you can find that also online. Thanks so much again for watching and listening. I will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.